So here's an interesting idea. Males compete for status and the essential dimension of competition that differentiates them from uh, women, I would say, is something like productive economic generosity. It's something like that. Now, it's not like women aren't productive and it's not like they're not generous, but the ground rules are different. Women are looking to equalize the economic disparity that's attendant upon differential cost for reproduction. And so men are evaluated on the basis of their potential for economic reciprocity and generosity. And that gives them status, males. And so women peel from the top of that hierarchy. Basically, they let males compete it out on the economic front, and then women select from the top down. And the higher the status a woman has, the higher the status of the mate that she can obtain. Now, that brings up a question, which is, what gives women status? And that's a really hard question. Because first of all, we know that economic viability is not one of those things. So male economic viability and sexual success are correlated insanely highly. It's like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, crazily high. One of the most powerful single variable relationships that you can find in all of the social sciences. Far higher than the relationship between intelligence and life success, for example. But the correlation between female economic viability and sexual attractiveness is lower than zero. So it's actually slightly negative. So it's a massive sexual dimorphism. So then you ask, well, what gives female status? And well, one of the answers is obviously associated with beauty and reproductive capacity and, and sexual attractiveness. Those things all tangle together extraordinarily tightly. But that's not the only thing, I don't think. And so this, I think, is really worth thinking about. So imagine that you have an attractive girl and a variety of relatively high status men are chasing her. Now you might ask, well, how do they evaluate her status? And I think they evaluate her status by her ability to say no. So imagine, you know, a high status person offers himself or herself to you. And of you, if you're of lower status, you're gonna say yes right away. But one marker of higher status is, well, no, I don't need what you're selling. Yeah, but what I'm selling is great. So yeah, but I have so many offers that I'm not inclined to take your offer because I have options. And it's no on the part of women that signal I really believe this is the case. It's voluntary no on the part of women that signals their status. And so I don't think young women know this at all because they want to know how to compete with men, let's say, in the power game. And uh, that's a tough question because women are smaller and they're not as physically powerful. And economic prowess isn't as attractive to them and it doesn't make them more viable on the mating market. So the whole game that women are playing is way different than the game men is playing. So you might say, well, how do women equalize the battle? And I think a huge part of that is by reserving to themselves the right to say no. And you see this, people are stumbling towards this realization even on the radical leftist front because they keep saying no means no. And I also think that there's every reason to think and plenty of evidence that that's also one of the things that makes women desirable in the eyes of men especially if the men might be enticed into pursuing a long-term mating strategy. You know, they'll push on women and see, well, will you say yes right away? And if the answer is yes, especially true for high status men, if the answer is immediately yes, then the guy assumes your status really isn't that high. You can't say no to me. But if the woman says no, even to you, the guy thinks, oh, well, you know, look at that. You can imagine there's some narcissism in that. Even though I have everything to offer that I have to offer, she's just not falling over, you know? Maybe there's something there that requires further exploration. You know, and you even see this in female pornography. It's so interesting because the classic female pornographic story is, you know, there's this extremely attractive, highly productive man who's got a real capacity for aggression. He's a pirate or a surgeon or a werewolf or a vampire or a billionaire. Those are the fundamental female pornographic tropes. And he has women at his disposal. But this woman is shielded off from him and they dance around each other for a long time, which essentially means that she's saying no. And he's finally enticed into a relationship with her where he sacrifices all, you know, his access to all other women. And then they have hot, steamy sex. And so, you know, most of female pornography is extended foreplay. And that's this romantic dance of no followed by, you know, a very spectacular consummation. And that certainly mirrors the optimal female reproductive pathway 
obviously, because otherwise it wouldn't be the hottest pornographic fantasy. But it's based in, I really think it's based in reality. And so I don't know how it is that you communicate to young women that, especially if they are of high female status, but even if they're not, that the most potent tool they have in their armament with regard to status, with regard to being taken seriously, is their ability and willingness to say no.